beyond these uh, complex interactions, um, there are two factors make the problem even worse. The first is that different components, the behavior are not static. They are controlled by a lot of parameters that are very hard to tune. Also, the TCP is under continuous error-prone development. For example, in just two months in 2018, there are 18 bugs found in the Linux GitHub TCP. So given all these different types of, type of complex problems, how do we diagnose TCP problem today? We use a tool called TCP dump. It's a groundbreaking tool, but only 30 years ago. And since then, it has been the gold standard for diagnosing TCP problems. But it's no longer scalable today because the, the bandwidth and the scale of the network has both increased by more than 10,000 times. So turning on TCP dump in the production will cause too much overhead. In fact, all existing diagnosed tools for TCP face the tension between getting more details and keep the overhead low. They either record lots of details but incur a high overhead, or they try to keep the overhead low but they miss lots of details. And they cannot achieve both because what they record is always what, uh, what we have for diagnosis. It seems very hard to break this tension unless we can get more information out of what we record. And this is what we build called deter. We introduce a replay. Uh, we introduce determin deterministic replay so that we can, in the runtime, we only record a very small set of data. And when a problem happens, we can replay to reproduce all the details. Here's an overview of it. In the runtime, we run a very lightweight recorder so it can run continuously on all the hosts. And when problem happens, the user can pick the, the connection that has the problem and use the deter replayer to replay the problem. And during the replay, the user can use any kind of uh, tools. It can use, uh, it can capture packets or read counters. It can trace the execution of the code of TCP. It can uh, even replay multiple times so that it can, it can iteratively, iteratively diagnose the problem to understand problem deeper and deeper. So these are the two key features of Deter. The intuition for being lightweight is very simple. Suppose we can record all the stocky calls. Then the TCP itself will automatically regenerate all the packets. But this alone fail to uh, deterministically replay the TCP. And this is because TCP has many non-deterministic interactions with other parties, including the switches, other connections, and also the kernel running on each host. So our key contribution is to identify the minimum set of data that enable deterministic replay. And to achieve this, we solve two challenges. The first is a network-wide one uh, caused by the non-deterministic interaction across switches and the TCP. The second is on each host, which is a non-determinism within the kernel. In this talk, I will focus on the first challenge because it's the most challenging one that involves a butterfly effect. The butterfly effect is caused by the closed loop between TCP and the switches that amplify any small noises. Let me give you an example. In the runtime, um, we record on the, we record all the socket calls and we really inject the same socket call in the replay. Uh, suppose in the runtime, the, the orange packet and the blue packet are very close in time. And uh, in, in the runtime, the blue have uh, arrived later, so it gets dropped. In the replay, there may be some very small selling time variation that is only microsecond level caused by various different reasons. And this small timing variation 
may cause the two packets to arrive at a very different at, at a different order. In this case, uh, the switch uh, because this switched order, the switch will drop a different packet. So this actually caused a switch action variation because the switch drop a different packet. This switch action variation will cause TCP behavior variation because the TCP congestion window is changed according to the packet drops. So in these two cases, the congestion window will become different, start to diverge. And after that, the TCP behavior variation will easily propagate to other flows and call, by causing more switch action variations. For example, in the runtime, the orange flow increased the window, so it sends more packets. A green flow that share a queue with it will drop the packet. But in the replay, the orange flow sends few, fewer packets, so the green flow will, uh, will get no drop. So this easily propagates to the uh, blue flow. And in a similar way, it will propagate to more and more flows across the whole network in just a few rounds. We call this a butterfly effect because it starts from a very small timing variation, but it can affect the whole network's behavior. A natural question to ask is, what if we can reduce the sending time variation? Can we do better? But we have shown by experiment that even one nanosecond variation can still cause butterfly effect. This is because um, the, the, the closed loop between the switches and TCP is still there. So in order to eliminate the butterfly effect, we must break the closed loop. So we have to record and replay something before the packet entering the TCP so that the TCP behavior wouldn't be affected. One naive way is to record all the packets that entering into TCP. This can make replay accurate, but it costs too much overhead. So our solution actually is based on the observation that most of the packets in the runtime doesn't have any changes. So in the replay, we can just let this packet go without any action. All we need to take care of are the packet drops, mar uh, packet marks, and sometimes reordering. These are the packet stream mutation. Uh, these are the mutations to the packet stream from one side to the other side. So in our solution, in the runtime, we only record these mutations before the packet entering the TCP. And in the replay, the replayer will read these uh, mutations and re-inject the same mutation to the packet stream. And this is a very efficient approach because the drop rate in this center is very low and easy and just cost one bit. And reordering is very rare. And also, with this approach, the replay of each TCP connection is independent. This is because different connections interact with each other um, via the packet drops or ECN. But we already make sure these actions are accurately replayed. So we just need uh, to replay each connection separately. For the same reason, we do not need any switches for replay because uh, those actions caused by switch are already re-injected by the replayer. These two features make the replay very resource efficient because we just need two hosts to replay uh, one connection that has problem. And in fact, we can even just use one host with two VMs running the, running the two endpoint of TCP. We have implemented Dieter in Linux 4.4. It just needs only 139 lines of change to the Linux kernel. And the, the recording is very lightweight. The storage only costs 2 to 3% compared to the packet header trace and in a compressed manner. Also, the CPU overhead is very uh, is always smaller than 1.5%.
we use Deter to do many case studies in real applications. Here I will demonstrate one case study that we did, we did in Spark application. We run a large job and uh, we collect trace for the flows. We want to diagnose the 99 percentile latency for the flows. And we find the result is very interesting. There are various different reasons for the long latency. And for the for the flow of different size, their reasons are actually very different. Also, um, uh, I will also show one example that is uh, very interesting to me, uh, during which I, I learned a lot debugging this problem. Uh, in this example, we with Deter, we can uh, first replace it and get, get all the packet trace. So after plotting the packet trace for one of these flow, we find it suffers from many delayed act problem. So it, it has a pattern that it is the sender send a burst of packet and the receiver doesn't respond until 40 milliseconds later. Then it sends one act for the whole burst. After that, the sender can continue to send another burst. This pattern can uh, repeat many times and uh, slow down the, the data transfer a lot. With Deter, we can replay again. And in the replay, we, 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 we instrument, uh, we, we collect the state, uh, monitor the state of TCP and uh, monitor the different code logic, the branches. And we find the reason of this problem is actually the receiver explicitly delays the act. And the reason uh, the receiver delayed act is because the receive buffer is shrinking. So this indicates actually um, the problem is caused by a slow receiver. This problem is interesting among uh, the various different reasons that we showed in the previous slide because it is actually an interaction between the transport and the receiver. We also use deter in many other case studies and we find many different reasons for causing retransmission timeout, such as caused by delayed act, exponential trend, uh, back off, and sometimes it may cause by small messages or misconfiguration of the receiver buffer size. There are, there are various reasons for causing the retransmission time, timeout. And only with the code level understanding of the problem, we can understand the root cause. And we also use data to diagnose the problem in switches. The intuition is that since we can replay the packet trace, we can just push the packet trace into a network to recreate the queues in the network. And we can do it in simulation by uh, accurately modeling the switch data plan. And we have shown that we can diagnose a temporary black hole caused by switch buffer sharing policy. So in conclusion, diagnosing the TCP performance problem is very challenging because there are various reasons and we often miss the important data for them. And data solve this problem by enable lightweight record in the runtime and use deterministic replay to reproduce all the details. To solve this, um, we have to solve a key challenge caused by butterfly between the TCP and the switches. And our solution is to replay, replay the mutations to the package streams. Data is open source and you are all welcome to use it. The next uh, project that I will talk about is HPCC, which is uh, the high precision congestion control. Today, high performance networking is desired in the cloud. We have already uh, discussed the new devices being deployed in data centers that has very fast speed uh, storage and computing chips. And they also have very low latency. Beyond that, there are also a new trend that the resources in a data center are getting disaggregated. So the memory and the CPU will be separate into different pools in the future. That means even memory access will go through the network which add more network load and uh, require ultra low latency. 
driven by this demand, um, the network the, and the NIC becomes much faster. But there are still two essential steps towards the high performance networking. The first is that um, the software, software cannot keep up with the high speed. So we have to offload the networking stack into the hardware. And there are many ongoing efforts such as RDMA or smart NICs. But simply making each sender uh, much faster will not solve the problem because as everyone send more aggressive, there will be more congestion. So congestion control is actually a very important problem in this area. Um, according, um, with, according to my um, experience in the industry, we find the congestion control is very immature in these high-speed networks. The state-of-the-art congestion control in the hardware offloading solutions either use ECN or delay as a congestion feedback. And the, and the operator today face many problems in operating the large-scale RDMA networks. And the root cause is the congestion control. Next, I will discuss three very typical and very common problems that is annoying the operator in data center every day. The first problem is that the congestion control converge very slowly. So what operator is facing is that they face buffer overflow um, very frequently, especially under incast or failure. So the operator have to use PFC to prevent packet loss. It can give the good performance on average, but it has to face the threat from PFC storm and deadlock under the incast of failure. But they cannot turn off PFC because that will give, just give very bad performance even on average case. If you are not familiar with PFC, it's fine because the root cause is the congestion control because it cannot control the buffer very well as it converts very slowly. The reason is that the feedback they use, such as ECN or delay, are imprecise. So it cannot tell the exact rate mismatch. So the congestion control has to gradually change their sending rate in a trial and error manner, which solves the congestion very slowly. Um, that in practice, they at most uh, half the rate every RTT. So in a large incast, it will take many rounds to resolve the problem. And this problem is more severe in higher speed networks because the higher speed will fill up the buffer much faster. The second problem is the standing queue. So today, operators in data center often find it hard to run bandwidth hungry applications and latency sensitive applications in the same cluster. Here is a ex real example. In the, the network has a very low base RTT and many applications such as machine learning uh, is rely on this assumption. But one day they all complain about a very high latency. So we try to diagnose the problem and we find there are many queues in the network that inflate latency. And these queues are built by other bandwidth hungry storage applications. The reason, the root cause is also the congestion control because their feedback such as easing or delay rely on building up the queue. So the congestion control intentionally keep standing queues in the network in order to get feedback. And in practice, this standing queue add, often add 20 to 50 microsecond queuing delay, which is four to 10 times more than the base RTT. So it completely wastes the ultra low latency provided by the physical network. The third problem is, the, is that the primary tuning of this congestion control are very complex. In, in, the, uh, in, in the problem, two problems that we just discussed, we see two trade-offs. Uh, one is between the stability and the utilization. And another is between the latency, getting low latency and getting high throughput. 
and there are many trade-offs in the in the congestion control. And these trade-offs are affected by many factors, including the traffic patterns, the failure scenarios, and different network architectures. But the feedback is imprecise, so they cannot tell exactly what these factors are. So the congestion control has to use heuristic to guess what's the current network condition and what the right rate adjustment should be. And these heuristics, heuristics come with many, uh, many parameters. For example, DCQCN has 15 parameters that, are, that interact with each other a lot. And it often takes several months for the operator to tune the parameters for each application because each application has different traffic patterns, different requirements. We find the problem of all, the, uh, all this problem share the one fundamental issue, which is the use of call screen feedback. They converge slowly because they have no precise feedback to tell how much to increase and decrease. Uh, they have standing queue because the feedback rely on the queue. And the parameter tuning is complex because there's no pre pre precise feedback. So they have to use heuristics that has lots of parameters. So one natural question is, what if we can have precise feedback? It turns out that this is the right timing to ask this question because today many switches are providing many details per packet. The feature is called INT. The way it works is that when the, uh, when the packet passes a switch, the switch will put some metadata, such as link, uh, link rate or queue length into the packet header. And every switch will append this data. So the host eventually will know what's happening in the network. In fact, big switch vendors such as Broadcom and Barefoot all have INT supported in their recent products. And this feature has actually been widely used in production, but only for diagnosis and monitoring purpose. So we ask how, um, how well we can do with INT as feedback for congestion control. And to answer this question, we design HPCC. HPC can achieve fast convergence because the sender know the precise rate to adjust to with the precise information. It has near zero queue because the feedback doesn't rely on the queue. And it has very few parameters because with the precise feedback, there's no need for the heuristics. Here's the overview of HPCC. After the receiver receives the packet with the INT data, it will echo back in the egg with the uh, INT data. So the sender can use this data to do the rate adjustment. But we also face two key challenges in applying the, the, the data to, for the congestion control. The first challenge is that the feedback may be delayed on the path. Both the packet on the forward path or the egg on the reverse path can get delayed. The second challenge is that if we blindly react to every egg, it will cause overreaction because the data reported by different eggs may have overlap. Let's see the first challenge. We must tolerate the feedback delay. In today's solution, um, they use rate-based uh, control. So that means um, it can, the, the benefit of rate-based control is that it can send traffic very smoothly. But when congestion happens, the feedback can come much later than the base RTP. In this case, the sender will have a very high sending rate and the high sending rate not only send for the first base RTT, but actually persists for, the, uh, for a very long period until the feedback comes. And this means when congestion happens, the high rate will cause even more, da more damage to the, to the congestion problem. So in order to solve this problem in HPCC, 
we let each sender to also have a window to limit the number of in-flight by in bytes. So that even when the congestion happens, even the feedback get uh, delayed a lot, it will send a limited number of packets. The size of window is determined uh, by this formula, which is guaranteed in theory that can guarantee the target sending rate. But adding this window also means we need a new way of measuring congestion. This is because for a rate-based scheme, the measuring congestion is very simple. We can just use the rate mismatch. But in HPCC, rate mismatch is actually a very bad measurement because the actual sending rate is non-constant. The sender may send for a while and stop sending because it reached the limit. And this pattern may be, may happen frequently in, or intermittently. So instead of, of using the rate, we use the total infla bytes to measure the congestion. Here's an example. We can view the network as a pipe of width B, which is a bottleneck bandwidth, and the length T, which is the base RTT. And each flow needs to estimate the total infla bytes, which includes packets not only, which includes not only the packet of itself, but also the packets from other flows. We can use INT to estimate the total infla bytes by using the transmit rate of the bottleneck times the base RTT. So this happens, uh, this is for the non-congestion case. When there is congestion, there are also queue in the network. So we need to also consider the packets standing, uh, sitting in the queue. So finally, we can use this formula to calculate the total infla bytes. The queue length and the uh, transmit rate are available in INT. And uh, the base RTT can be easily measured in advance. In this way, each sender can estimate the total infla bytes independently in a distributed manner. After knowing the total infla bytes, we, just, uh, we, we already know that how much more it can send or how much fewer it should send. So we can just use MMD to quickly adjust to the right rate. Now let's see the second challenge. So we need to achieve fast reaction without overreaction. To achieve fast reaction, we can do it per, per act but blindly react to every act will cause overreaction. Here's an example. Assume the network pipe volume is six packets and there are a total of nine packets in flight. After the per first packet gets acknowledged, the sender will reduce its rate by 1.5, which is nine over six. And uh, after the second packet gets acknowledged, the sender will continue to reduce them. And this will cause over, uh, overreaction because the set of packets being sent, uh, being acknowledged by the two X are largely the same. So which means the sender react to the same set of packets multiple times. And this will continue as more uh, acknowledge can come back. One way to solve the overreaction problem is to react every RTT. So the way it works is that um, when the first act comes, it will reduce window. And it will also remember the next packet sent after the first act. Then the sender will ignore all the acknowledgement until the, the next packet to acknowledge. In this way, the sender will not have overreaction because the set of packets it reacts to are, are, are different. There are no overlap of the packet reported by 2x. But the priority reaction also have its own downside because um, if after the first acknowledgement, there are sudden bursts come, then the sender will miss the opportunity to react quickly to the sudden burst. 
But this is actually the benefit of having a per act reaction. So in our paper, we use uh, we HPC combines the per act and the per additive schemes so that it can achieve uh, no overall re reaction where still can quickly react to a sudden burst. We have implemented the HPCC in commodity FPG NICs. We, uh, we have a total of 14,000 lines of very low code for the whole NIC, but among them, only 2,000 lines are for the congestion control. So it's very lightweight. And moreover, it only consumes less than 2% of total hardware resources. And we also use many um, hardware specific optimizations, such as we use a local table to speed up the division operation. We also design a hardware friendly uh, lookup table compression so that we just need 10 kilobytes to, repre to represent a range of 4 million numbers. And it will also use multiple parallel engines to support more concurrent flows. The INT overhead is very small. It just consumes 4.2%, assume the uh, MTU is only one kilobyte, which is the state of art of RDMA. We have ev evaluated HPCC in many different settings. We uh, evaluate in both the real test bed and a simulation. We test many different traffic settings with different application traffic at different level of traffic load. We also inject a different level of incast and we tried many mi micro benchmarks. We compare HPCC with DCQCN timely and DCTCP, which are the state of art solution in production. Always they are recommended parameters. And we compare in terms of the flow completion time and the Q-Lens distribution. In all of these scenarios, HPCC performs much better. Um, here I will show one example I taken from the testbed. We compare with DCQCN because that's the only available hardware solution that we have. We use the web search traffic at 50% load, and we see that HPCC can reduce the tail F, uh, flow completion time by at most 95%. And we also measure the q, uh, the q length distribution over the whole network. We can see that HPC keeps the Q very low. Even at the 99 percentile, the Q length is only uh, 23 kilobytes, which translates to seven microsecond queuing delay. We also compare with other con uh, control schemes, uh, but they are unavailable in hardware. So we do that it in simulation, and the conclusion are similar. In conclusion, HGPCC has both practical impact and also have advanced in the congestion control. It demonstrates the problem of existing congestion control with real production experiences. And we demonstrate using the precise information from INT, we can make the congestion control highly performant. We also address many challenges of using INT as a feedback. And we have implemented HPCC in hardware NICs and switches. In our paper, we also show proofs for the convergence speed, the queuing delay, and the fairness for HPCC. Today, Alibaba has already deployed HPCC in their production. And there are many NIC and switch vendors, such as Manalox or Broadcom, they are adopting HPCC in their future products. So this concludes the two projects that I uh, talk about today. Today we are at a very exciting time for networking because on one hand, we have emerging diverse set of applications and devices. On the other hand, we also have high speed physical networks. So we really need um, good solutions to match the demand and the supply. And in this talk, I have talked about uh, two, uh, two solutions uh, that can make the transport highly efficient. And I believe we are at a very good start point and I look forward to many um, new opportunities and interesting problems to solve. Thank you for listening. 
and any questions are welcome. Questions? Any questions from the audience? Um, okay. Uh, so Jenna, is that what we will stop here if there are no questions? Thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, since this is kind of a preliminary version of uh, William's job talk, so we would really like feedbacks as well. Um, so if people have some feedbacks on the talk, especially the beginning part, um, please feel free to email us or, or speak now. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay, thank you, Yu Liang. Um, I think we're done. Yeah. Thank you, guys.